Welcome to the Vice Chancellor's Forum on the Life and Work of Walter Rodney. My name is Richard Bernal. I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor for Global Affairs at the University of the West Indies. It will be my pleasure to guide you through and moderate through this program of very distinguished speakers. Let me begin by giving a little background because many of our viewers are not contemporary with some of the events which will be spoken about during this forum. The 1960s was a period of great change and turmoil across the world. It was a period of the decolonization of countries in Caribbean and Africa, many of them becoming independent. It was also a time of change in Europe, student demonstrations, particularly in the late 60s, the civil rights movement, black power, etc., in the United States. So too in the Caribbean, it was a period, a momentous period of change, a rising of black consciousness and uh, a new sense of nationalism and a feeling of confidence in our ability to chart our own course of economic development, to make social change and to influence global events. In the late 60s, Walter Rodney joined the Department of History at the University of the West Indies at Mona. It was a halcyon period because at that time a number of brilliant Caribbean academics returned to the Mona campus. People like Norman Gervin, Trevor Monroe, Orlando Patterson, C.Y. Thomas, Alistair McIntyre, Havelock Brewster, uh, it, as well as some non-Caribbean scholars like Ken Post. Over in history, there was Walter Rodney, there was uh, Edward Brathwaite, and there was a great period of intellectual ferment. Also at that time, the university began to reach out beyond its boundaries, not only to students and to academics, but to the public in general. And Walter Waradney was in the forefront of that movement of bringing education and discussion and inviting non-UWI personnel to join the discussion. In particular, he taught African history to the general public. It's against this background that his career was launched, a career which took him to Africa and back to Guyana eventually. He was killed on the 13th of June 1980 by a car bomb. We are showing this in commemoration of the 40th anniversary of his death. We're starting the program with our own Vice Chancellor, Professor Sir Hilary Beckles. Like Walter Rodney, he is a very distinguished historian. Indeed, he has studied many of the topics which were of concern to Walter Rodney. Slavery, its impact on Caribbean development, the legacy of slavery, etc. And therefore, I'm going to invite our Vice Chancellor, Professor Sir Hilary Beckles, to open the program, as he always does, bringing the lessons of history and the relevance and legacy of history to bear on contemporary events. Sir Hillary, please take the floor. It is entirely fitting and appropriate that UWI uh, should honor in this way, and indeed uh, academia uh, in the region and the wider world uh, should, should celebrate and honor the, the legacy and contribution of, of Walter Rodney. In many ways, he was the best of UWI, a brilliant young intellectual rooted in Caribbean development discourse. A student demonstrating his extraordinary intellectual gifts 
uh, and his participation in pedagogy uh, around African and Caribbean history and translating that knowledge into community activism representing the, the intersection uh, between, between scholarship and social transformation. He was therefore, uh, from all angles and dimensions, the, the ideal UWI student and scholar. His, his moment um, in the 60s uh, represented the, the midpoint of the UWI's uh, academic journey in that he was uh, participating in that transition uh, that pushed UWI away from 30 years of the colonial scaffold as it was seeking to lay the foundation for the nationalist regional liberational liberating university and he would have been conscious therefore of the colonial UWI at pain to give birth to a university that was rooted uh, in the intellectual and political work uh, of, of the region. So his moment, therefore, was the, the high point in the decolonization of the intersection between the UWI and the wider, and the wider Caribbean. The fact that he chose UWI as the place to mature and develop the politics of the crossroads has to do with the identity of UWI as both the seed in which the seed from which the Caribbean would evolve and simultaneously he is the soil that enabled the fertilization of his own imagination. So simultaneously, therefore, UWI performed these two roles, and it was Walter Rodney at that critical moment that brought those functions together into a coherent public and institutional pedagogy. His conception of history as concept for the understanding of the, of the past, and at the same time developing the empirical base for political action, meant that inevitably what he presented was liberation history. And in the presentation of liberation history, he felt it necessary therefore to connect campus to community to global liberation. The success with which he executed these projects enabled him to emerge in very short time as a phenomenal icon of academia and as a young man, as a sage within the political philosophy of African and diaspora cosmology. His was a humanist history, a humanist political practice, grounded no doubt in his personal views of his own masculinity and domesticity as a man, as a husband, as a father, and understanding as a black man what the Middle Passage had done by way of fragmenting and subverting all of those ideologies. His Caribbean consciousness, therefore, was complete in the sense that he saw the entire Caribbean world as his community. He was not a nationalist, 
though he recognized that the Caribbean in its diversity was structured in terms of multiple nations and communities and uh, emerging from Guyana uh, he was he was able to develop both a specific practice as well as a general Caribbean and global practice. Historicizing then his role, at the beginning he was, as I have said before, at the beginning he was the, the energy source that sought to push the university and the region away from the colonial scaffold to enable West Indian Caribbean identity to emerge with its own authenticity. But at the end of his at the end of his life, he was reflecting the challenges associated with the first phase of independence and the need to resolve certain questions in respect of preparing for the second phase. So the the assumption that a generation of independence uh, from the 60s through to the 80s would have dealt fundamentally with serious reform and recognizing dialectically that the empire was going to strike back and resist the depth of those transformations. Walter's political engagements in the region at the end of the 70s and 80s was to, was to lay the foundation for what would be the second phase, the second phase of Caribbean nation building. A phase that was understood to be more challenging beyond the constitutions of independence, beyond the definition of the nation and the symbols of nationhood, uh, focusing on issues of, of economic justice, social justice, economic democracy, the inclusion of marginalized, historically marginalized community, that these were going to be the basis of the discourse in the second phase. And it was in this second phase conversation that we, we lost arguably one of the finest minds that this region has produced. And uh, in this discourse around the second phase of, of nationhood, in this region, there, there is still a space, there is still an, an empty space, a vacuum that Walter Rodney would have filled and filled out. And uh, the loss, the loss of his mind, his energy, his friendship, his personhood has been a tremendous strategy for the region and for the world. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Professor Emeritus Rupert Lewis, formerly professor at the University of the West Indies Mona campus. We have invited Professor Lewis to speak about Rodney because he has done extensive work on Marcus Garvey and Walter Rodney. He has published two books on Walter Rodney, one of which we are going to show you on the intellectual and political thought of Walter Rodney. And more recently, he has done one specifically on 1968, revisiting the year in which Walter Rodney was prohibited from re-entering Jamaica, having traveled to a conference in Montreal, Canada. I've asked Professor Rupert Lewis to introduce the life and work of Walter Rodney because Many of our viewers are not contemporaries, don't know much about Rodney, and therefore, before we get into specific aspects of his life and work, I've asked Professor Lewis to give us a general overview within which we can fit the other presentations. Professor Lewis, I now offer you the podium. Walter Rodney was born on March 23, 1942 and was murdered on June 13, 1980, at age 38. 
leaving behind Pat, his wife, and three children, Chaka, Kanini, and Asher. His funeral in Georgetown was attended by thousands of people. I was in attendance representing the Workers' Party of Jamaica. Forty years later, I cannot think of a better set of circumstances in which to memorialize Walter Rodney than the nationwide movement in the United States protesting white supremacist violence against black people and the corresponding global response. A distinctive feature of 2020 is that a mass movement is taking shape in the world's most powerful country during the COVID-19 pandemic with severe consequences for health and economics. This pandemic has exposed the inequalities that make black people more vulnerable. Youth activists across the world today can draw on the legacies of Rodney's educational and organizational work in the 1960s and 1970s. Edward Percival Rodney and Pauline Rodney were his parents. His mother worked at home and Rodney's father earned his living as a tailor and was an activist in the then People's Progressive Party that had Indian and African supporters. In 1953, when Chedi Jagan's Socialist Party won the election, the British sent in the military consisting of 500 soldiers who departed from Jamaica aboard the HMS Superb headed to British Guyana to quell the nationalist movement. Walter was only 11 years old at the time, but he was aware of the actions of British imperial power and the indignities of colonial subjugation. He was educated at Queen's College in Georgetown and from there won a scholarship to the then University College of the West Indies in 1960 and graduated in 1963 gaining a first-class honors BA degree in history. Walter Rodney went on to complete his doctoral dissertation on a history of the Upper Guinea Coast, 1545 to 1800, at the School of Oriental and African Studies, University of London, in 1966, at age 24. During his undergraduate years, Rodney had traveled to Cuba, intrigued as he was by the Caribbean's most recent revolution, led by Fidel Castro and Che Guevara. He also visited the Soviet Union. This brought him to the attention of the police special branch in Jamaica. The decades of the 1960s and 1970s, in which Walter Rodney was intellectually and politically engaged, saw the maturation of counter-cultural movements such as Rastafari, Rude Boys, and the Cultural Rebellion inaugurated in ska, rocksteady, and reggae music. Fifty years ago, the Trinidad Black Power Revolution of 1970 compelled Prime Minister Eric Williams into developing the state sector in oil and finance. Young people in the Caribbean were reshaping their nations, and nowhere was this more evident than during the People's Revolutionary Government, led by Prime Minister Maurice Bishop from 1979 to 1983. This reshaping was being informed by research in history, social sciences, and epidemiology, as evidenced in Professor Ken Standard's Community Health Medicine at the University of the West Indies, Jamaica campus. Radical intellectual thinking in the New World Group influenced groups throughout the Caribbean, which championed the dismantling of plantation agriculture, campaigned for land reform, the development of manufacturing, black entrepreneurship, and the end to endemic racism in the region. Associated with these youthful movements, were women activists such as Andaye, a close colleague of Rodney in the Working People's Alliance of Guyana. 
whose writings under the title, The Point is to Change the World, have recently been published. Walter Rodney signed a contract with the University of Dar es Salaam in Tanzania in 1966, during the period of radical political and agrarian reform in Tanzania under the leadership of President Julius Nareri. Tanzania at the time was the headquarters of the Organization of African Unity's Liberation Committee, and Dar es Salaam became the base for many of the exiled liberation movements of Southern Africa. Among these organizations were the African National Congress of South Africa, Front for the Liberation of Mozambique, Frelimo, and Movement for the Popular Liberation of Angola, MPLA. In this atmosphere, Rodney developed his Pan-African perspectives, deepening his research into the history of African resistance to colonialism. Walter Rodney returned to Jamaica to teach at the University of the West Indies in January 1968. His radical views and association with Rastafarians and the Black Power movement in Jamaica led to his being banned by the government from re-entering the country after he attended a Black Writers' Conference in Montreal, Canada in October 1968. The demonstration of university students together with Kingston's urban youth against this ban marked a watershed in Jamaica's political development as the scale of mass action in Rodney's support surprised the regime of the Jamaica Labour Party led by Hugh Shearer. Richard Small, a close Jamaican friend and attorney, described Rodney as being of average height, articulate, gentle, quiet at times, but with strongly held views and an unassuming presence. I would add that Walter had a compelling rationality and wealth of knowledge to call on in support of his views and a willingness to listen. He was not a populist, nor did he believe that he was a messiah. The Jamaica government had brought back Garvey's body in 1964 and made him a national hero. But four years later, the government banned the writings of Malcolm X, Stokely Carmichael, the Black Panther Party, and the Nation of Islam. Rodney's succinct response was, quote, they brought Garvey's bones, but not his philosophy. Rodney defined Black power, quote, as a call to Black peoples to throw off white domination and resume the handling of our own destinies. He wrote, Black power as a movement has been most clearly defined in the United States of America. Slavery in the United States helped create the capital for the development of the United States as the foremost capitalist power, and the Blacks have subsequently been the most exploited sector of labor. Many Blacks live in that supposedly great society at a level of existence comparable to Blacks in the poorest sections of the colonial world." Unquote. In addition to the demonstrations of October 16, 1968 in Kingston, Jamaica, there were protests throughout the Caribbean, in Tanzania, Africa, in Canada and London, and on some university campuses in the United States. In the nearly 10 months in 1968 that Walter Rodney had spent in Jamaica, he not only taught on campus, but spoke to groups in the inner city communities of Kingston and many parish capitals. He went to schools, he went to churches, and he every opportunity that he had, he spoke and listened to different groups. He had an extraordinary ability to speak with and listen to working people and to unemployed youth and explain the significance of Africa to Caribbean history and the importance of the struggles against the racial and social legacies of slavery and colonialism. Rodney returned to lecture at the University of Dar es Salaam from 1969 to 1974. In 1972, he published his best known work, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. This work brings together historical scholarship and development theory to argue that the transatlantic slave trade 
and Western capitalist slavery did serious damage to Africa in depriving Africa of millions of its young people during the 16th to 19th centuries. It was also critical of the impact of colonialism in retarding the development of the continent. Rodney's book is more than protest literature in that it advances a revolutionary humanist view of development and decolonization at a time when many countries on the continent were achieving political independence, a process that was also underway in the English-speaking Caribbean, whose territories were populated largely by descendants of the African slave trade. For some scholars, Rodney relies too heavily on dependency theory of the 1960s and how Europe underdeveloped Africa has been criticized for not looking sufficiently at the internal factors in Africa that accounted for the slave trade and African underdevelopment. Ironically, however, much of his early work had focused on internal factors that had retarded Africa's development. And his analysis of Africa's traditional elites was caustic. So in a sense, how Europe underdeveloped Africa was a departure and the emphasis on European involvement in the hugely profitable trade completed his treatment of the relationship between European slave traders and plantation owners on the one hand and on the other hand, Africa's elites who facilitated the slave trade. In the same year that How Europe Underdeveloped Africa was published, his doctoral thesis, A History of the Upper Guinea Coast, 1545 to 1800, was published by Oxford University Press. In 1975, he had two chapters on the Guinea Coast and Africa in Europe and the Americas in the Cambridge History of Africa. The latter essay was a pioneering study of the African diaspora with emphasis on Brazil. He also studied the Russian Revolution from an African perspective, and his lectures at the University of Dar es Salaam in the early 1970s were published in 2018 under the title, The Russian Revolution, A View from the Third World. Walter Rodney returned to his native Guyana in 1974 and was denied a job at the University of Guyana by President Forbes Burnham, who saw in the young scholar activist a political opponent whom he preferred to have outside the country or inside his political organization, the People's National Congress. Rodney was associated with the opposition party, the Working People's Alliance, a political organization that sought to offer a non-racial approach to Guyanese politics in a country where party politics had been divided between Chedi Jagan's East Indian-based People's Progressive Party and Forbes Burnham's African-based People's National Congress. Between 1974 and 1980, when he was murdered at age 38 by a booby-trapped walkie-talkie given to him by a member of Guyana's Defense Force, Rodney lectured in the United States and Europe for short periods in order to secure an income. He continued his research and complete working on a history of the Guyanese working people, 1881 to 1905, which was published posthumously in 1981. This work embodies his philosophy on the creative role of ordinary people in the making of history and introduces the contribution of African slaves to the humanization of the Guyanese coastal environment in creating an elaborate system of canals to provide drainage, irrigation, and transportation in a remarkable transfer of Dutch technology to a coastal landscape that was below sea level. This was to have been the first volume on the Guyanese working people in the 20th century. In 1982, A History of the Guyanese Working People, 1881 to 1905, won the American Historical Association's Albert J. Beveridge Prize. And in 1983, the Association of Caribbean Historians also gave a posthumous award. Rodney's reputation as a historian of the Caribbean was duly recognized. 
Rodney harnessed history in the service of African and Caribbean decolonization with a view to giving his readers a sense of their creative capacity to build post-colonial societies. The Barbanian novelist George Laming in his foreword to A History of the Guyanese Working People, 1881 to 1905, described Rodney's approach to history as, and I quote, a way of ordering knowledge which could become an active part of the consciousness of an uncertified mass of ordinary people and which could be used by all as an instrument of social change. He taught from that assumption, he wrote out of that conviction, unquote. Walter Rodney possessed the capacity to communicate complex ideas to small study groups and large audiences with great clarity, drawing on his solidly rooted knowledge of African and Caribbean history. Scholarship and activism were inseparably linked in Rodney's life, and he paid the ultimate price in Ghana when he was killed by the Forbes Burnham regime because of his political leadership in the Working People's Alliance against the dictatorial rule of the People's National Congress. In 2016, a commission of inquiry in Ghana into Rodney's murder 40 years ago concluded. One, Gregory Smith, a soldier in the De Ghana Defense Force, murdered Dr. Walter Rodney. Two, Dr. Walter Rodney was a man of large and significant stature, both in Ghana and beyond at the time of his death. He could only have been killed in what we find to be a state organized assassination with the knowledge of Prime Minister Burnham in the Ghana of that period, unquote. To conclude, Rodney's academic and activist legacies are an important treasure for movements such as Black Lives Matter in the 21st century. Thank you. Our next speaker is no other than Dr. Ralph Gonzalez, the Prime Minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And if you'll permit me a personal interjection, I recall very well that the first day I was to attend class at the Mona campus, when I got to the main gate on Mona Road, it was locked, chained, blocked, and there were students there, and there were placards. I then learned that the government of Jamaica took the decision to prevent the re-entry of Walter Rodney, a lecturer at the Mona campus who had gone to a conference in Montreal, Canada. Students on hearing this decided to have a demonstration. I didn't go to class that day, there were no classes. I joined the demonstration and the demonstration was led by one Ralph Gonzales, who was president of the Guild of Undergraduates. I recall well that we went down Mona Road where we got our first whiff of tear gas just as we uh, were approaching Ligony. And then we went down to Jamaica House and demonstrated and again we got a second treatment of um, tear gas. But by this time we had learned that carrying wet rags and uh, using bolt like sprint would take care of the a, this dispensing of, of tear gas. We went from there down to the Parliament Garden House where we demonstrated and were joined by a lot of non-UWI people. And it was a very powerful demonstration. So, without further introduction, the Prime Minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Dr. Ralph Gonzalez. He's going to talk about the Rodney events that he took part in and the subsequent importance of it. Dr. Gonzalez, Prime Minister. I got to know Walter first in 1968, personally. But of course, I knew of him prior to 1968 when I entered UWI at Mona, Jamaica in 
October 1966. I knew of his tremendous record as a student activist, as a brilliant student and intellectual. And of course, we followed his own career as a historian to his PhD in, in Af the School of African and Oriental Studies in the in London, and then his sojourn for a short while in in Tanzania, and 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 he came to Mona, as I recall it, in 1968 in January, and he lived a, a short life because when he was assassinated in 1980, Walter would just have been in his late 30s. And he has a, an important body of scholarship. The most important one from a popular standpoint, and I believe the one which has had the greatest, the greatest impact, is his classic was published by Google Overture called How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. The, the thesis was very straightforward and he's used a dialectical materialist, historical materialist analysis, a, a Marxist analysis adapted to the actual circumstances of the what he was studying, this is a relationship between Europe and Africa, and that the underdevelopment of Africa was a consequence of, of, of Britain, of, of Europe's interface with Africa through uh, colonialism, um, imperialism, including modern imperialism, and neocolonialism. And he provided chapter and verse, a very persuasive um, a thesis. When Walter came to Jamaica in, in January 1968, he came to teach Caribbean history. In fact, I was in one of his classes. He was teaching Caribbean history, he also taught African history. And we, we became we became friends because I was evolving into a similar trajectory like like Walter. Um, philosophically, and you know, played a lot of dominoes, um, which is a game which he, he loved very much. He'd come, he'd come on campus, or uh, we'd meet elsewhere and play dominoes. And I knew of his work in Jamaica among the poor, the working class, Rastafari. African um, youths, Jamaicans of African descent, young people. And following upon what has taken place in the United States, and you remember the important publication by Stokely Carmichael and Charles Hamilton, Black Power, and, and the rise of Black Power in the United States at the tail end of the civil rights movement and this philosophy of black power drew inspiration among other things from socialism but, but very much so from Gavi and from Marcus Musai Gavi and from Malcolm X and, and, and others. And Walter's work among the Jamaican dispossessed and the students, young people generally, published in a, a, a slim volume called Wronged in with my brothers and sisters. In October 1968, Walter attended a Black Writers Conference in Montreal, Canada. And he was banned from returning to Jamaica on the 15th of October, the afternoon on the 15th of October, 
At the time, I was president of the Guild of Founder Graduates, and I had assumed office on the 1st of August, um, 1968. We learned about his banning as a security risk, a threat to national security, his wife and and uh, child and she and Pat Rodney, his, his, his wife was, was pregnant. Uh, and and um, I began with other students to mobilize that very evening on, on the campus. And in the morning, we led a massive demonstration into the city. In Jamaica, since the 1938 uprising, the, the, the size, the scale of it surprised those of us who are the organizers of this particular protest. Um, we are joined by thousands of unemployed youths, Rastafari, and dispossessed persons in the city. There was a lot of destruction of property. Um, it is claimed by persons who are uh, uh, not by the bona fide marchers. And a lot of property was destroyed and buses overturned and the like. And there was there there was set in, in Jamaica after that a reaction. It often happens after an upsurge, a progressive upsurge. If you're not careful, you can have a reaction, and that is what, what that is what happened. It has happened many times historically, and many of us suffered for our involvement in, in, in politically, personally, in in, in, in this huge um, protest. No, just think of it. A man who has been in the country for just 10 months, by virtue of his educational work and mobilization among people and the working people and persons of African descent among the quote unquote underclass and lump and elements and our rest of our brothers and sisters, that the spark which the students provided, it, it, it lit really a combustible, a body of combustible material, which um, was there in the terrible social and economic conditions of Jamaica um, on the periphery of monopoly capitalism, um, ostensibly wealth by a handful of people, uh, 21 families, and um, but a lot of poverty and real difficulties in the social situation. Walter continued after Jamaica, after he was banned, we didn't get him to come back to the university. And Walter went off to Africa, to Dar es Salaam again. And I was next to meet Walter. In Dar es Salaam, I, I, I was doing my PhD in political economy between the University of Manchester and Makerere University in Kampala, Uganda. And I, I, there were the Eastern Central African Championships and I went to play cricket. The Makerere in Dar es Salaam. And I went to walk by Walter and we met there. This would have been 1972. And he was doing tremendous work among the long, young intellectuals in Africa and was writing a tremendous amount of, of uh, path breaking work. Um, he would have been working at the time on how Europe underdeveloped Africa because that was published, I think, in April 1973 in London by Bogle Overture Publications, as I've said before. 
um, Walt eventually returned to the Caribbean and went to Guyana and got involved with the Workers Working People's Alliance, a multiracial, socialist, socialist oriented, broad based, socialist, socialist oriented, revolutionary democratic organization, um, uh, building links between the different ethnic groups and the uh, part of the, the, the political ferment across the region. Um, and when the news came that he was killed, was assassinated June 19, it was a terrible blow to everybody. I, I, was, in, I was in the United States at the time, 1981, sorry, I was in the United States at the time. And um, he, he I was, I was a short stint teaching. And, and um, Walter, his memory lives on, his ideas. He is committed to the working people. He is an, an activist, intellectual. In fact, in Guyana, he wrote while he was with the WPA. The history of the Guyanese working class is a fantastic um, volume. Uh, and he was a selfless individual, a man of great humility, a, one of the best examples of the children of our Caribbean civilization and was cut down just too early. And many of us, what we can do in to honor his memory is to continue to do what Walter would have done. We were not able to do it with the same degree of excellence, but to be to ground ourselves among the poor and the working people and the nation as a whole, build regionalism, build the links across the world between progressive anti-imperialist forces, um, very much so to build with Africa, the Caribbean and Latin America, but also Asia, to look into the developed capitalist countries, European ones, North American countries, to work with progressive forces within those countries and build a better world for, for all of us. I am very pleased that the University of the West Indies is associated with this particular memorial for Walter. But we want the memorial in marble. We want us to interrogate his ideas improve upon them, fashion, ambitious programs, compelling developmental narratives, and to organize to implement them for the betterment of our Caribbean civilization. And we are talking about being in this particular uh, landscape and seascape. But of course, for working people and the poor and um, the anti-imperialist forces, anti-racist forces all over the world. He, without doubt, is one of the most outstanding activists, intellectuals of the 20th century Caribbean um, in the line of persons, for instance, like C.L.R. James. And Walter would long be remembered. And I want to take this opportunity um, on behalf of the government and people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines to work, to, to, to set apart and the children, Walter's children and grandchildren, that we revere Walter, we love him, and we are always in solidarity with him and you.
it is very interesting that we, this has taken place, this memorial this year, this remembrance is taking place at the time of the popular upsurge in the United States on the banner, under the banner of Black Lives Matter, which this banner we must reaffirm over and over again. And uh, I rejoice as a citizen of the world and as prime minister, and on behalf of the government and people of St. Vincent and Grenadines, I rejoice in solidarity with the resistance, the popular broad-based peaceful resistance in the United States. Um, the, the resistance against um, fascism, fascistic methods, um, racial injustice, and to build a more equal, fairer society in the interest of all persons. And um, this remarkable nation we call the United States of America, a remarkable country and people. Doesn't matter how many persons want to tell that it would be great. Its greatness will remain unrealized unless daily there's a lived experience that manifests itself in Black Lives Mattering. Black Lives Do Matter. And you can't fight ideas. You can't fight injustices. You can't fight the Walter taught us this. You, 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 you can't fight um, to keep down people just with bullets, guns, and briberies, and threats. There's a resistance in us, and we will resist. We will resist, and we will triumph because the, the oppressive forces they cannot fight the future, cannot hold back the future, which of all time is the only time which we cannot desecrate. And in order to avoid the desecration of the future, we have to fall in line with the ideas and praxis advanced by a giant of our Caribbean civilization, Walter Rodney. And all of us will do well to hold the injunction of the Hebrew prophet Micah in our work. What does the Lord require of us? To do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. I wish everyone associated with this University of the West Indies project all the best. And as we remember Walter today, this week, we don't forget the others. Marcus Gavi. We don't forget Bob Marley. We don't forget earlier Chateauier from St. Vincent and the Grenadines. We don't forget those who have struggled over the entire period since these societies were formed to make our lives better. And Walter, in, in the political vineyard, to make our lives better. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Professor Varian Shepherd who is the director of the Center for Reparations Research here at the regional headquarters of the University of the West Indies in Kingston, Jamaica. Professor Shepard is a renowned and extensively published historian on a wide range of topics from slavery to East Indians in the Caribbean, and she has done extensive work on Walter Rodney. Indeed, in 2014, she delivered the annual Walter Rodney Memorial le a Lecture at the University of Warwick. She has become even more widely known 
in Jamaica and the Caribbean because of her widely listened to program on history in which she brings history to the public, educating them about the relevance of history, the continuing enlightenment and which can be derived from history, and this has done a great deal to improve our understanding of our history, but of the importance of history. And this encompasses the general public and school children, very much in the way in which Walter Rodney took his teachings outside of the university into some of the poorer areas of Kingston, and into Augustown. Professor Shepard, we're pleased to welcome you. I know that you will enlighten us with your topic of groundings with Walter Rodney on history, heritage, and activism. I'm honored to have been asked to participate in this Vice Chancellor's Forum, designed to sing praise songs to Walter Rodney who variously self-identified as a guerrilla intellectual and a revolutionary intellectual. He would have been pleased that his work has inspired so many of us to walk in his footsteps and that unlike in his day, the current revolution against anti-black racism is being televised. The format of this talk today is a sort of grounding with Walter Rodney on history, heritage, and activism, following his own example of direct dialogue. And so I begin. Dear Dr. Rodney, those who are close to you tell me that you would have preferred Dear Walter. But as we never met, I did not want to be so familiar. Of course, I've met you through your works, and the writings of Rodney scholars like Professor Rupert Lewis. I even had discussions about you with those who were close to you, including your wife, Pat. Still, I did not wish to be so familiar. I should tell you right away that I lectured in the same history department of which you were such a distinguished member in 1968. Of course, due to unfortunate circumstances, you were in the department for only a very short time just under a year, and I was there from 1988 to 2010. Even though I never met you, I have always been drawn to you. I guess that is because I was born with a natural affinity for people who abhor all forms of discrimination and inequality and who stand up for social justice. I must tell you that I was angry at how my country treated you in 1968, and even now, 52 years after the event, I still feel obliged as a Jamaican to apologize to you for such treatment. The irony of it all is that we now celebrate our heritage and our heroes during that very week in which the anniversary of your deportation falls. And some of those who have been elevated to the rank of national heroes and heroines and whose lives we celebrate that week were black people who bawled out for justice, black power activists with an anti-imperial ideology just like yours. I have not been the same since I read How Europe Underdeveloped Africa as an undergraduate student at Mona. In this work, you helped all of us to understand the roots of European enrichment and the negative consequences of colonialism on Africa. It was one of the four most influential books in my formative academic life, the others being Eric Williams's Capitalism and Slavery, C.L.R. James's The Black Jacobins, and Franz Fanon's The Wretched of the Earth. I am told that these authors, along with Amy Césaire and W.B. Du Bois, also influenced you profoundly. Later on, I found your history of the Guyanese working peoples whose ba basic aim was to show that working people of African and Indian descent in Guyana have a history of active struggle, which traditional history has omitted. Very helpful. As I pursued research on Indian settlement in Jamaica, you argued persuasively that every struggle planted a seed of creative disruption 
and aided the process that, re re that released. You argued persuasively that every struggle planted a seed of creative disruption and aided the process that released new social forces in the continuing drama between capital and labor. Would you believe that so influenced was I by your work and your life that once I had done the BA and MPhil in history at the University of the West Indies, I wanted to pattern you and to do the PhD in African history at the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London. I actually applied to source and I was shortlisted for a Commonwealth scholarship, but for family reasons, I had to postpone graduate studies. When I did restart my PhD project, I did so at the University of Cambridge, but still in the UK. And those three years in the UK cemented the importance of your work into my consciousness because the development of the United Kingdom at the expense of the colonized world was obvious, including on the visual landscape. Other aspects of your life have inspired me. Your refusal to imprison yourself within the walls of academia, your deep commitment to activism and public service, your sense of political mission, looking out for the interests of the working class and playing a personal role in advancing the cause of black liberation. Influenced by your wife, Patricia, you transformed yourself from a guerrilla intellectual to a revolutionary intellectual. But in your view, and I quote from you, to be a revolutionary intellectual means nothing if there is no point of reference to the struggle. As Robert Hill states, the consciousness of the overlapping domains of popular struggle in Africa, America, and the Caribbean formed the basis of your essential political mission that guided your career as a revolutionary and as a scholar. Inspired by you and the other pioneers of the Department of History, like Douglas Hall, Kamal Brathwaite, and Elsa Gavaya, I too have come to embrace the philosophy that history prepares us for activism, that history is a way of ordering knowledge which could become an active part of the consciousness of the uncertified, not the uneducated mass of ordinary people, and could be used by all as an instrument of social change. Of course, I'm not alone in this. Indeed, you would be pleased at the way in which many of us at the University of the West Indies have followed your example and embraced the role of the public intellectual. As you have stressed so often, the Caribbean was the site of the formation of European ideas of modernity and their construction of notions of hegemony. And all of us who live in the Caribbean space have been deeply offended by the actualization of such notions of hegemony and feel the need to preach against it constantly. We are aware that none of us can match your stature as a public or revolutionary intellectual, but most of us, especially those who, like you, have working class origins, have shunned the path of the classic intellectual associated traditionally with ivory tower and snobbishness, despite the persistence of this meaning of the intellectual in the popular perception. We share the views articulated so well by Edward Said that the intellectual is an individual in society that confronts orthodoxy and dogma, who cannot be reduced simply to being a faceless professional, a competent member of a class going about his or her business, but an individual endowed with a faculty for representing, embodying, articulating a message, a view, an attitude, a philosophy or opinion to as well as for a public. That the intellectual must hold to certain universal standards of truth about human misery and oppression, despite his or her national background or class affiliation. That sometimes the public intellectual must be prepared to be an exile and to be marginal. My colleague historians and I have been challenged constantly to demonstrate the relevance of history to Caribbean human development needs while maintaining the quality of our discipline. Such a challenge has come from students concerned about the relevance and marketability of a major in history, as well as from stakeholders in the larger society, concerned about the use of their tax dollars and the relevance of the University of the West Indies to Caribbean social development in the light of competing socioeconomic needs. In fact, today, 
the debate over history, truth, and objectivity unleashed when postmodernism was in vogue has become, according to Richard Evans, too widespread for all but the most obscurantists to ignore. Many history texts, the critique goes, exist in a dialectical relationship with their social and historical context, failing to take on contemporaneity. Among the questions that were posed by the postmodernists were, whose history gets told? In whose name? For what purpose? While some in the society regard history as an irrelevant subject, there is an opposite view in the society that history has an active cultural and political role because of its relationship to national and regional identity and engaged in applied history and climbed over the walls of academia to demonstrate the transformative power of history education to a people seeking for a more liberating narrative of self. At the University of the West Indies, we are guided by the AAA strategy, which rests upon three primary pillars, access, alignment, and agility. With the reduction of social inequality and efficient and effective alignment with society and economy, research and public advocacy programs, which reach the underserved and diaspora Caribbean populations, and all others with, a, with an interest in higher education, on all continents being strategic goals residing at the core of the plan. In your paper, The Role of the Historian in the Developing West Indies, you argue persuasively that, and I quote, it is one of the tasks of the historian of the West Indies to approach the society in a different manner and to lay emphasis on precisely what was going on in the region. This would certainly lead to the presentation of new heroes with whom the West Indian people could identify themselves, an important psychological necessity." End of quote. You thought that the UWI should assume responsibility for popularizing such knowledge, and we have been doing so. Many in the region have responded to the critique of history and to the public demand that as a university, academics whose salaries taxpayers have to pay we must justify our existence and their contribution and use the discipline of history in all its transformative possibilities to provide the answers to many of the topical issues that form the basis of public debates. And public debates, there are. Indeed, we are seeing in the Caribbean a growing need for historians to provide historical context for the outbreak and impact of pandemics, for climate change, an environmental degradation started by conquest and the plantation system, the enduring legacies of colonialism, and for the justification for the reparation movement. We have risen, I think, to the need, especially on the matter of repatriate justice. The 2013 decision by the CARICOM heads of government to establish a CARICOM reparation commission, led by Professor Sir Hilary Beckles, the activist vice chancellor of UWI, National committees and a center for reparation research renewed the media's interest in the historical basis of the reparation issue and revived the debate on radio and television discussion programs. Even though many may wish to bury it, the slavery and reparation debates were heightened in the region in 2015 when former Prime Minister of Britain told us that instead of demanding reparation for African enslavement, we should forget the past and move on. Former Prime Minister P.J. Patterson was so outraged that he wrote this in the Gleaner of October 8, 2015, in response. I quote from that article. You have refused to apologize, yet your government has apologized to everyone else for horrid crimes. Are we not worthy of an apology or less deserving? I guess Mr. Cameron did not know of the late Vice Chancellor of the UWI, Rex Nettleford's view, that we cannot drive without a rearview mirror. And I think the protests around the globe telling Europeans that black lives matter, I think mirror this quotation by Rex Nettleford. Historians are here to remind him. We are an integral part of the reparation movement started by First Nation peoples and enslaved Africans, carried on by Rastafari, grassroots people and organizations, academics and individual politicians and now joined by the heads of the Caribbean community. 
a critical source book for those amassing evidence to advance a claim against Europeans for indigenous genocide and African enslavement and its legacies is how your, how Europe underdeveloped Africa. Despite the alternating peaks and troughs of the movement, we carry on firm in our resolve to hold European governments responsible for this crime against humanity using as our strategic plan, the CARICOM 10 point action plan, the basis of which is the redevelopment of the Caribbean as a counter to the underdevelopment wrought by colonizers. In closing, let me say this. You self-identified first as a guerrilla intellectual and later as a revolutionary intellectual. Your purpose? To use knowledge in service of the working poor. You have disciples, Dr. Rodney, and as one of them, I honor you today, the anniversary of your murder in Guyana, by people who did not share your dream. My hope is that one day, one day, compensation will be paid to your family for what they did. They know themselves, but will they ever know truly what they did? May the ancestors continue to surround you, and may justice be done by perpetrators for what they did to you here on earth. As Marcia Griffith would say, stand firm and keep the faith. Your reward should be great. We are all stepping out of Babylon one by one, so we will eventually meet. Rest in power. Professor Clive Y. Thomas, popularly known as CY, is a Ghanese economist who has written extensively on the problems of development, and in particular, the development of Caribbean countries, the possibilities of their transition to socialism, he has a famous book called Dependence and Transformation, dealing with how small development economies can transform themselves. He's written extensively on democracy and the threats to democracy. He is a contemporary of Walter Rodney. They both were teaching at the Mona campus in 1968-69, and uh, they were colleagues in political struggle in Ghana. They were both members of the uh, Working People's Alliance in Guyana. They were friends and colleagues, and therefore it is so appropriate that Professor Thomas is going to speak to us on the reflections on Walter Rodney, reflections of a friend, colleague, and fellow activist. I'm very pleased that today I've been invited to speak at this VC forum in honor of Walter Rodney. Uh, Walter, Walter is a very good friend of mine. He's also a colleague. And although we have a few years difference in age, we've overlapped with a number of institutions. We both went to the same high school in Guyana, Queen's College. We both taught at the same university. Universities, the University of the West Indies and the University of Dar, Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. We both went to the same university. I went to the University of London at the London School of Economics, and he went to the School of African and Oriental Studies. So there's a large overlap in our academic life. Because I was a couple of years older than him, we weren't great friends. Because I started the school level. Older boys didn't encourage younger boys to be their friends. The age difference, although just two or three years, was heavily exaggerated at that time. Because that's the whole nature of being a teenager and growing up. But the time we spent together at the um, University of Tanzania, and later the University of Ghana, when he came here also, he got a refused job. Was I think the most productive time that we spent it together as intellectuals. So I'll probably emphasize most of my contribution today on that aspect of our relationship, that period of our relationship. I would say that the um, most striking thing I think about Walter has been his very open and creative mind. 
He came from a rather left-wing tradition. At that time, he was very Marxist, very class structured in his perception of reality, but very nuanced in terms of the importance of race and class and color and the matters that are important in that regard towards development. He also recognizes the colonial project, but the particularly invidious project, particularly as emphasized and exhibited in the development of the plantation system in Guyana with a rigid institutional ruling um, or a ruling order that part, that covered the preparation and production, cultivation and production of sugar and its export out of Guyana. Later that was joined by bauxite and aluminum, but the same authoritarian structure tended to dominate. And in the course of our relationship, I think we um, both, both managed to help each other in, in the, the intellectual development. Because my concern was a very un important concern. I was of the view, and still remain of the view, that there are no peoples on earth that are more committed to issues of freedom, democracy, representation, of, of persons, justice, than the ex-slaves that are alive, descendants of slaves that are alive today. Um, and therefore that should be an integral part of any conversation that we have, any proposal that we have for development. As you know, at the time, most Marxists thought that democracy as exhibited in one person, one vote, was a bourgeois conception. And I told him that's a serious fundamental error because the same Marxists who were making out that it's a bourgeois conception were in fact going to be very offended if they are denied their rights of the freedom of choice, freedom of vote, freedom of expression, freedom of association in the countries in which they live. And there can be no other people more committed to the notion of personal and representational freedom than the descendants of a slave. Because we were treated as chattel and we were um, so, so bonded into servitude that we were denied every single conceivable human right. There could be no justice. So there's no possibility, I argued with him. And I think he very readily accepted the, the point of view. So when he came to Guyana and he was um, instrumental in developing what we call the Working People's Alliance, it was always founded on the condition that we represented not only a movement in favor of workers' development in terms of material conditions of life, but also political conditions of life. I mean, for my part, I wrote a book which tried to express these ideas, the rise of the authoritarian states, which I tried to theorize as a construct that emerged out of this colonial negation of the importance of the democratic uh, pursuit. Um, but he um, readily embraced it, even though he came from a very radical tradition, which was more revolutionary in fact. So I think that during those years, I would hope that if he's listening to this, wherever he is, he would recognize that we had a, a very symbiotic relationship and that both of us benefited out of it. And I think that is to the great credit of Walter. Because although he was a, considered a hero in the Caribbean and he's looked up to everywhere, he's always willing to keep his um, mind open the ways in which he could advance that creativity. And I am personally very happy that he did that. And having said all of that, I think that it's important to recognize that in the 40th anniversary of Walter Rodney, there could be no better opportunities than the one to present themselves today to recognize the importance of his work, particularly for us here in Guyana. We've come out of a very traumatic election experience, which brings to the fore the whole 
continuing question of the importance of free and fair election. Every election in fact has had that as a foundation issue starting from the court set of elections we had before. But at this point in time it has come out as a very fundamental um, motion. And the difficulty of it is that uh, when you have a racial by stated society, the one racial group enjoying a narrow but important plurality of everybody to vote against the other major group, then the election ends up being an ethnic census. So the question arises, church, election, are elections the best way forward? in a society where the party is so closely joined. I think to me that Walter had developed the notion that we need to restructure the way in which we organize our electoral processes. And from that, they developed a number of ideas which directed the Westminster system, but not an inherent democratic idea but rejected it as a practical solution because we recognized that we needed to ensure that justice is done at the structural level as well as the individual level. So that the development will take place and the group will not lose their strength to fight to dominate the other group for fear that if they did not dominate the other group, the other group would dominate them. But we have not been very creative in Guyana in terms of arriving at any electoral reform. And in the absence of that, I think the problems that we face today will continue forever. In the same way, at the global level, the problems we recognize today, based on the um, struggles and issues arising from racism and the absence of justice for black citizens in the United States, first, there are problems. It cannot be solved by the, by the fact of the vote because they are, that would never be in a large enough number, except in what places across, across the country, to be able to dominate the outcome at the level of governance. So they need to be a justice system which is accommodative to that structural reality that race and slavery are important parts of American history. And Walter would have recognized that, and he did recognize it, and see that we cannot advance purely on the grounds of um, the literal application of one person, one vote, and not take into account the constitutional context in which that is now. So I would say that this um, particular forum I think honors in terms of the issues which it has to contend with today, the whole life and legacy of Walter White. I cannot imagine two more um, important conjunctures in contemporary history than the ones we face both internationally and locally in Guyana at this particular point in time. So the 40th anniversary of Walter White assassination in Ghana is an important conjuncture, not only in Guyanese history, but in Caribbean history and in the history of the wider world. So I would be very pleased, I'd be very pleased to have the opportunity to make that short presentation on this matter. Thank you. It is my pleasure now to invite Professor Anthony Bogues, popularly known as Tony, to address us. He is a professor of humanities and critical theory and director of the Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice at Brown University in the United States. Tony Bogues has studied widely the philosophical and critical tradition of Caribbean thinkers. He is world renowned for his work on CLR James but his work extends across a range of contemporary topics, including Rodney, and he has edited or written a number of books 
One which you will see on your screen is a book of papers on the life and work of George Lamy. Today, he's going to speak about Walter Rodney, historical thought, and the Caribbean intellectual tradition. It is with pleasure that I introduce my friend of many years, Professor Bogues. Walter Rodney is a central figure of the 20th century radical Caribbean intellectual tradition. This is a tradition in which Marxism, Pan-Africanism, radical black nationalism, radical Caribbean nationalism, Rastafari thought, as well as other Afro-Caribbean religious cosmologies have made a distinctive effort to grapple with history. In the late 19th century, there were other figures of this Caribbean radical intellectual tradition, J.J. Thomas, Edward Blyden, and Theo Furman, who were all focused on contesting the explicit theories of white and colonial norm normative superiority based on a pseudoscientific understanding of natural history. However, the 20th century radical Caribbean intellectual tradition has really focused on the questions of history, has been trying to think about what is the relationship between our history, the politics, what's the relationship of history to the literature and indeed to all other art forms. In trying to think about this, one therefore has to understand that what we are talking about is the ways in which the 20th century radical intellectual tradition has tried itself to practice history. In this brief talk, what I want to do is to talk about Walter Rodney's practice and conceptualization of history itself. Now, in thinking about this, one of the things that I think might be important to understand is why this preoccupation with history. Amrikar Cabral, a very important African thinker from Guinea-Bissau, in a remarkable speech that he made in another Caribbean island in Cuba in 1966, made this particular point. And this is what he says. He says that the colonial domination is really about, Cabral says, the negation of the historical process of a dominated people, end of quote. Therefore, for Cabral, the business of reclamation of history is very much part of the decolonization process, what he calls that the, the regaining of the historical personality of a people. So the anti-colonial struggle moves along the axis of historical reclamation, making the questions of history and historical knowledge crucial ones for power and therefore for politics. Historical thought is dependent upon narratives which recount the past, but this recounting is not simply a chronological one, which maps continuities and ruptures, nor does it just construct neutral meanings which can be discovered. Rather, this recounting is related to power and the organization of domination. There's always a politics about historical writing and historical thought, and it is so for two reasons. In the first instance, there are ways in which historical writing addresses the past, and in doing so, constructs silences which radiate both from the archives and the historical methodology which is deployed. These silences then become missing parts of a dominant narrative, which is then constructed. The second reason is that there is then politics, that is the politics of the moment. The, the issues and the concerns which shape the questions that may trouble the historians. Michel Rauch Julio, a, the late Haitian intellectual, noted that history, Michel Rauch Julio says, is really a story about power, a story about those who have won. What this means then is that history or historical knowledge of the past is typically generated by the question which arises in the present. Let us take Walter Rodney's work, for example, on African history. Why would Walter Rodney be preoccupied with African history? 
was it, was it not that at the moment that his preoccupation was manifest, that it had to do both with the absences of African history in the Caribbean, and that secondly, that he lived in a, in a period in which Africa, continental Africa, was understood as a, as a place that had no history. Walter Rodney's work, therefore, around, on African history was really about then trying to answer these two particular questions. The question of why the absence in Caribbean depth of African history, and also trying to debunk the colonial understanding of Africa as a place that has no history. Before just dealing specifically with, with Walter's historical writings, I want to say a few things about his work in politics, which I think is important in trying to understand his historical work. Rupert Lewis has, has written that Walter Rodney was one of C.L.R. James, that other very important Caribbean intellectual, the intellectual son. And James himself, in a speech, pays tribute to Rodney's life after, <clears throat> after Rodney's assassination. This is what C.L.R. says, and here I quote him. I, referring to himself, Amy Césaire, referring quite frankly to that Martinican poet, late Martinican poet and playwright, George Lamin, George Padmore, the Trinidadian Pan-Africanist, W.B. Du Bois, the African-American intellectual, and others were faced with a particular challenge, C.L.R. says. We had to fight the doctrines of the imperialist powers in order to establish some Caribbean foundation for the underdeveloped peoples, in quotation marks, he says. Walter, CLR continues, did not have to do that. He was able to look upon the revolutionary experiences and analysis of the Caribbean as something natural, normal, fixed, and written beyond dispute. What I want to suggest is that this preoccupation of Rodney about the nature and possibilities of revolution or social change drove his major historical works, than two in particular, how Europe underdeveloped Africa, and then his final his historical text, The History of the Guyanese Working People. Rupert Lewis also describes how Walter wrote the, how Walter wrote the, uh, the History of the Guyanese Working People. Rupert Lewis, he notes that for the last six years of his life, Rodney was an independent scholar, while he was deeply involved in Guyanese politics. This dual engagement, that is of writing history and engagement in politics, <clears throat> meant that by 1979, 1980, Rodney had become a symbol of resistance to the authoritarianism and the corrupt regime of then Forbes Burnham. Rodney held the view that revolution and social change, he argued, were rooted in historical specificities. It meant that for him as a radical intellectual, he always had to return to the source to develop both a historical and detailed understanding of his own society. After being away from the Caribbean for over a decade, Walter Rodney returned in 1974. If in 1968, when he was forced to leave the region, Left-wing and radical groups had begun to emerge in the post-independence period. By 1974, when he returned, a distinct regional left had established itself. In 1972, or two years before his return, return to the Caribbean, Rodney delivered a talk in Washington, D.C., titled Some Aspects of the Political Economy of the Caribbean. In this particular talk, he compared the neocolonial situation in Africa and the Caribbean and remarked on, upon the various similarities. At the end of the talk, Rodney proclaims the following, and here is what he says. He says that the question of organization, meaning political organization for change, is at the top of the priority list. He did not change this view about the immediate possibilities of Caribbean movements for social change. And then by the time, therefore, he began to work on the history of Guyanese uh, working people, the long-term political conditions in Guyana shaped what he was saying. Part of this, or what he was preoccupied with, part of these long-term conditions was complicated by race and ethnic conflicts. 
It was a situation, therefore, that he, began, that he needed to address. Rodney began to work on one of his, on this critical element of the relationship between historical knowledge and social change by trying to think through what is the relationship between the different ethnic groups, Afro-Guyanese and, Af and Indo-Guyanese, in the Guyanese context. His own, particular con his own particular understanding of this, as he had began to think about from the 1960s, when he was at UA, the Mona, and this is what he writes. The racial problem, he says, was politicized to the point that it became social violence. And since then, there has been no racial violence, but the hostility and apathy, and, and apathy of the period has obviously carried over. He, wants, he goes on to make the point that it is important to understand that this racial and ethnic divide, he says, in, in, um, in, in, in Ghana, was one in which African and, and Indian people would organize a, around, around their interests as producers in Guyanese society, as distinct from pursuing a myth of racial superiority or racial subjugation. In other words, what Walter was preoccupied with was a particular way in which the ethnic and racial conflicts in Guyana had actually shaped Guyanese society, both its colonial society as well as its post-colonial one. In another essay written in 1966 called Masses in Action, this is what Walter says about this particular issue. It is obvious that the question of the interrelationship between race and class consciousness is of utmost importance in the decade after 1955. These two factors proved antagonistic, and consequently the anti-colonial struggle of the Guyanese masses received a serious setback. However, he continues in the same article, in the 1900s and 1928, the situation was entirely different. In other words, what Walter was pointing to, and we begin to try to work out in the history of Guyanese working people, was a kind of commonality that existed between Indo and Afro Guyanese working people. With this, with this in mind, I want to suggest, therefore, that the history of the, the writing of the history of the Guyanese working people was a political task for Walter Rodney which required historical skills. In suggesting this, I would argue that because histor historical traces are embedded with each, within each human society, and that these traces become the ground for historical consciousness, then the construction of a society's historical consciousness is always a contested one. What it means is that in trying to write a different kind of history, that is a history from below, then there needs to be a new construction of the narrative of history, a new way of thinking about these historical traces, and then trying to write a new history, which would point to the possibilities of a different kind of societies. This is so, I would argue, because political consciousness is constructed both in everyday political practice and also the creation of historical knowledge. Walter Rodney was keenly aware of this, because if we remember in his 1960 lecture, African History in the Service of the Black Revolution, he already posed the question of the use of historical knowledge as a weapon in our struggle. This, I would argue, was of course tied to his own view of himself as a radical Black intellectual, as someone who had to, in his view, attach himself to the activity of the black masses. In writing A History of the Guyanese Working People, 1881 to 1903, Walter Rodney, Rodney was involved in a practice of, his, of historical writing while simultaneously engaging in a political act. The book then was to establish two grounds. The first was to an attempt to establish a new narrative about 19th century and early 20th century Guyanese life. Secondly, it was an attempt to carefully illustrate the capacities of the Guyanese working people as makers of history. All this means that, as I said before, the text can be called a history from below. 
However, there's a distinct difference in Waters' understanding of history from below. History from below, as we know, begins as an English Marxist historiography uh, current, which attempts to examine and then reconstruct the ideas of ordinary people. Primarily, it was not a history about institutions, nor about movements, but rather focused on the lives and activities of ordinary people. This kind of history, I, I therefore had to find new archives and has produced many profound historical works in the mid 20th century. However, history from below tends sometimes to ignore broad issues of political economy. But for Walter Rodney, political economy was always central and he was preoccupied with this, indeed perhaps obsessed with this idea of political economy. Thus, for him, it was about trying to think about the history from below, trying to think through the ways in which institutional and politics worked, and doing that in a way in which it could not be separated from acts of resistance, but also could not be separated from political economy. And so for, for Walter, this is what he writes. Each day, he says, and this, he says, in the life of the member of the working population, there was, was a day in which there was both struggle and accommodation. And what he, he goes on to say that what you, therefore, what history for him becomes a way to think about the material conditions, that is the political economy, which shapes questions of power, resistance, and accommodation. And in Walter Rodney's historical theory, I would posit that what you get is a analysis, a historical analysis, followed by a methodology in which there is power, there is resistance, there is accommodation, and then again followed by resistance. All of this means that for Walter Rodney, social life was never stable nor static, and therefore uh, history had to represent that fluidity. In Rodney's work, therefore, everyday resistance was a tactic. Explicit in the history of the Guyanese working people, this tactic organized around itself around the humanization of the landscape, so the guy, of the Guyanese landscape. For a historian to find these tactics in archival record and testimonies required both new sources and sometimes a different optic on the old sources. The last two chapters of this particular book pays attention to race and then discusses the 1905 riots. These two chapters are critical because they bring together Walter's primary preoccupation how to tell a different story of Guyana who thinking about questions of race and racial conflict and ethnic conflict in Guyana, but learning from different historical lessons that, that happened in, in, in Guyanese history and how to think about those lessons in trying to, under, to create a common narrative for the, for a common narrative for both the Indo and Afro Guyanese working class. In the conclusion of the history of Guyanese working class, Rodney perhaps makes one of his major statements about historical writing and its relationship to social change. It is fair to say that as a groundbreaking book, the history of the Guyanese working class, sorry, the history of the Guyanese working people is in many ways followed a narrative style that was fairly descriptive. Its focus on social stru structures rather than events compel this kind of historical writing. However, there is a tension in this work which Rodney himself identifies. And in perhaps one of the most remarkable sections of this indeed remarkable book who is, is, can be found in these words. Rodney's sense in doing all of this work of, of political economy, of working through resistance, of trying to find the common ground between Afro-Guyanese, and of uh, and, and indo guyanese Rodney says sense that something was perhaps not quite right. He hadn't yet achieved what he wanted to. And it can be seen at what he says towards the end of the text. This is a long quote, but I think it's important to quote it. This is what he writes. This study, what Walter says, has sought to show some of the ways in which the Guyanese working class constituted itself through its own activities. Much more will have to be researched and written on the emergence of the culture, and this is my emphasis, of the, on the, work, the, working, on the working people 
and the wage earning class in particular. Only the opening up of the cultural history can definitely indicate what made the working people exercise particular choices at any given moment, what made them long suffering or impatient, or what transformed them from apathy to combat. In making, in working, right, end of quote, in writing about this particular dissatisfaction and pointing to tra, tra, pointing to the cultural life as one way in which we could begin to understand the missing elements of the so of the very remarkable descriptions that he has given us. Walter Rodney is, move, is trying to move history in the Caribbean to a different register. In Caribbean thought and in the Caribbean general in the Caribbean intellectual tradition. The late novelist from Guyana, Wilson Harrison, was in thinking about historical writings in the Caribbean, in a particular lecture he gave in the 1970s, stated the following. He says, and here I quote Wilson, that between the historical convention in the Caribbean and the Guyanas and the arts of the imagination, I believe that a philosophy of history may very well be buried in the arts of the imagination, end of quote. Rodney's work, and particularly his last sentence, expresses this particular cleavage, a fact that his conclusions makes clear. Harris, Wilson Harris's position calls for an ending of the so-called divide in Caribbean thought between historicism and poeticism, as he asks us to begin to think and examine Caribbean thought and history through a different set of, uh, of optics and archives. Harris suggests that C.L.R. James and Elsa Govaya, that remarkable teacher of Walter Rodney and historian of the of UWI Mona, comes closest to having a philosophy of history. For James, he argues that this philosophy of history was the Marxist dialectic. For Elsa Govaya, he says the principle was of egalitarianism. However, what I think Wilson Harris misses is in, in, is in Gavaya's remarkable work, path, and her path breaking work, the historiography of the British West Indies, she writes the following, and here I quote her, in history, time supplies the continuum, but not the principle of change. To observe that principle, it is still necessary, Bill Cotin as a Gavaya, to seek beyond the narrative of events, a wider understanding of the thoughts, habits, and institutions of a whole society. I would want to suggest that what Walter was trying to do in the history of the Guyanese working people, particularly at the very end, and in that last uh, sent those last sentences I quoted, was to try and understand the, the thoughts and habits of, of the whole society. And that therefore to do this required a different kind of historical imagination. I would want to then, in the end, suggest that Walter Rodney's historical writing, particularly for Europe on the developed Africa and the history of the Guyanese working people, was an attempt to fuse issues of political economy with historical knowledge. In other words, it was an attempt to move to uh, to create a history or to write a history from the question from just thinking about structures to that of human interaction. And to think about this business of human interaction then required Walter to begin to think about the questions of culture. He was beginning, I would want to argue, to think about theorizing Caribbean society in that way. George Lamin, the Barbadian novelist, notes, and here I quote Lamin, that Rodney believed that history was a way of ordering knowledge which could become an active part of the consciousness of an untutored mass of ordinary people. For Walter Rodney, I would argue, history was an active part of consciousness, not a kind of static block, but rather something from a, a messy past from which we could reach back to, to answer some of the questions that we pay, that were posed to us today. I would argue that Walter under had this view of history because he was animated by politics, both therefore and saw politics as a, as a historical necessity and also as a way in thinking about questions of possibilities. Walter's Rodney historical practice, as we have noted, was inspired by C.L.R. James and, of course, Elsa Gavaya, who taught him. Gavaya taught Rodney, as we know, 
And this is, and he has this, this acknowledgement in the history of Guyanese working people. He says to Elsa Gobayo, for all she contributed to my growth as a historian over 20 years. With regard to James, Walter notes that he was involved with others, with, uh, others in his CLR, James Study Group in London, and says that it was one of the most important things of my life. And I got out of that, ex out of that experience a certain kind of, a certain sense, he says, of historical analy analysis. It is not enough, he says, to understand state and revolution written by Lenin. It was important, Walter says, to understand why it was written and what was going on in Russia at that possible time. To grapple with the meanings of why is one objective of a certain kind of historical imagination, an historical imagination that pays attention to the business of culture. But the why is not simply cannot simply be explained by structure, nor can it only be explained by culture. Rather, we, if we find in culture the forms of meanings and the ways in which those meanings are constituted, then those meanings really are about the reflection of the, of the structure of life and society itself. As a radical thinker of both history and politics, Rodney began to grapple with the deepest meanings of Caribbean society from the perspective of the ordinary person, the everyday person in Caribbean life. As we remember him, we also we should not just invoke him as a seminal Caribbean intellectual in a time which is long past. Rather, we should remember and recall his life as an invocation for the yet unfinished work in the Caribbean. That is, the creation in the Caribbean of a society in which we have abolished all the vestiges of racial slavery and colonialism, that we, in which we have created societies of strong equality, justice, and freedom. The struggle for such a society was at the core of Walter Rodney's historical and intellectual, political, and activist work. It is something that we want to remember. Thank you very much. It is now my distinct pleasure to introduce to you Professor Clinton Hutton. He is Professor of Caribbean Political Philosophy, Culture, and Aesthetics at the University of the West Indies Mona campus. He is well published on a range of topics. He has a very important book on the Haitian Revolution. He has worked on Garvey, Rastafarianism, and a range of other related topics. However, this doesn't do justice to the multi-talented Professor Hutton. He's a painter, has done some very powerful work in oil and in pen and ink of Marcus Garvey and themes in African and black struggle. Today, he's going to speak to us about Walter Rodney, history, culture, philosophy, and the agency of decolonization. Walter Rodney, History, Culture, and the Philosophy and Agency of Decolonization. Perhaps there is no better time to examine the topic, Walter Rodney, History, Culture, and the Philosophy and Agency of decolonization. At the heart of decolonization is justice. Decolonization is requisite not just for the descendants of those who were enslaved and colonized, but also the descendants of those who benefited from the system of slavery and colonialism. Black people can and must be free from mental slavery, but they cannot be free from white supremacy. If white people are not free from white supremacy. <laughs> 
Walter Rodney graduated from the University of the West Indies in 1963, the same year that the Jamaican government gave orders to arrest and even to kill Rastafarians. As you may know, that Walter Rodney was heavily influenced by the Rastafarian movement in Jamaica. And when he came back to teach at the University of the West Indies, having done his PhD at, um, in African history at the School of Oriental and African Studies, he started to go around to inner city communities as well as rural communities to teach and to reason with people about their history, the history of, of uh, the African diaspora, as well as the history of Africa before um, colonialism, and uh, of course, during colonialism. He, he did this in sessions that were called Groundation, which is the same as to say Nyabingi today, but the term Groundation is still used. It's a, a session of reasoning initiated by the Rastafarian movement across Jamaica in Rasta camps in which, apart from reasoning, there is music, dance, and other rituals respecting the history and the culture of our people. Indeed, uh, the book written by Walter Rodney called Groundings with My Brothers uh, came out of those reasonings. As a result of those reasonings, the government of Jamaica declared him persona non grata in 1968, the same year that he came here um, to teach at the University of the West Indies. It led to riotings, in, uh, especially in Kingston, and it led to the closing down of the University of the West Indies when students um, en masse uh, demonstrated, marched to the, the Jamaica House, marched to the Ministry of Education. The reason why um, Walter Rodney was banned from Jamaica um, was later articulated by a former Prime Minister, Edward Siaga, in one of his books, which is that in teaching about Africa and about African history and about the history of black people generally, that that would incite hate for white people. And, and especially it would, um, it would um, have an adverse impact on the tourist industry in Jamaica. So, he was removed. It was at a time when books on black power, as well as Marxist literature, were banned in Jamaica. Um, it's a time in which, although with education, with, with emancipation, uh, well, not emancipation, we can edit here. Um, Although Jamaica became an independent nation, uh, August 6, 1962, and declared its motto to be out of many one people. What really happened is that measures were taken to perpetuate, in to some respect, an important respect, the, um, the colonial trajectory of this country, um, especially those related to education and related to, to the development processes um, that 
the newly independent state, um, state, um, and uh, and and the elites um, wanted to take the country towards, and therefore Rodney was seen as a threat. Um, the Rastafarian movement was certainly seen as a threat, and the brutality that Rastafarian um, movement endured during colonialism never stopped with the grant enough independence. In, in Walter Rodney's uh, thought, history was central to the issue of the philosophy of, of, of um, decolonization, the, the, the philosophy of sovereignty, uh, the philosophy of being, the philosophy of agency. And in this respect, um, Walter Rodney is coming from a long tradition, the tradition seen in the philosophy of, of Marcus Garvey. Um, and before that, um, persons like Edward Blyden, Frederick Douglass. So he came in that tradition, and certainly in the Caribbean, George Padmore, Sailor James, and uh, Eric Williams. Um, certainly Walter's book, Our Europe Under Developed Africa cannot be seen um, aside from uh, Eric Williams' Capitalism and Slavery. And later on, we'd see um, where uh, Professor Hilary Beckles even went further um, on another route to, to look at the issue of um, Britain's Black Debt, the issue of reparation for slavery and native genocide. History was central to knowing ourselves, of framing our stories, of knowing where we are coming from, of articulating our existence. Therefore, in relation to the, 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 uh, the philosophy of knowledge, what we call epistemology, History was very important to understand that. The history of African peoples, the history of their struggle, the history of African peoples before colonialism, the history of African people during colonialism, that these were very important in shaping a philosophy to guide our development after independence. And hence, Walter Rodney, using this, went into communities to reason with other Jamaican folks about their country, about the Caribbean, about the African world, and, and how we should proceed. Using um, the indigenous um, tradition of resistance and philosophy and sovereignty as articulated by the Rastafarian movement. Having stated that history provides a guide, in the, 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 the guide for the development of a philosophy of freedom and sovereignty, Walter Rodney then proceeded to articulate that not just in the curriculum, but to articulate that at meetings with persons who are willing, who are willing to, to listen to him. In reasonings, because he saw this as a two-way thing, that, not, that he's going there to impose and to, and, to, uh, and, and to people about his views, but also to learn from the people, which he did. So history is also therefore connected to pedagogy, that philosophy of freedom 
articulated in the philosophical tradition of the people who have endured slavery and colonialism must also become the philosophy, uh, the, the source, the basis of what we teach, of how we teach. And certainly the purpose of teaching is to another end. The other end being knowing ourselves, the ontological, the issue of identity, that, that people cannot become sovereign and become independent actors outside of the rubric of colonial thinking if they do not know themselves. And therefore, for Walter Rodney, history of the African peoples prior to colonialism, during colonialism and after, should be central to the issue of identity, central to the issue of people knowing themselves which, by the way, Garvey regarded as the first principle of the struggle for people for freedom, that is knowing themselves. And so Walter Rodney, in using history to guide the philosophical development of education, of reasonings and of pedagogy was aiming to shape people's conception of themselves, the rediscovering of self, and on the basis of that, how they can therefore shape their action that knowing self or that self-discovery should shape agency. That is to say, to develop the capacity to make things happen within the timeline, the futures, the struggles, of formerly colonized people to redefine and reshape their futures and as the basis for their political activity. As a result of that, he was set upon, he was uh, he was banned, he was declared persona non grata, and uh, very much maligned. But as we can see today with what is happening in the United States, it is not that the problems in the United States were problems that came about just now were problems that were created yesterday or the day before. They were problems made over 400 years ago and problems that were always with us since that time. Problems that led to violence, violence against uh, people of African descent, um, problems that shape the culture and the structure of, uh, of inequality, uh, problems which relegated uh, people of African descent to second class citizens or even to non citizens. In the country where they were born, the country of their birth, the country that they have contributed 
uh, uh, that were brought to and enslaved so that they could build, build Europe. That state of affair, the superstructure of slavery and colonialism, its philosophy, its culture, its psychology, continued to this day. And as a result of that, shape political struggles, as well as to shape the type of solutions that are required for the solving of these problems. So while people of African descent are still looked down on philosophically, aesthetically, I mean, by the way, there was a book one of the books that were uh, that was banned in Jamaica in the 1960s while Rodney was here was a book called Black Beauty. The book, a book about a black horse. Uh, certainly, uh, blackness being articulated as being beautiful was seen as subversive. And there are many different ways in which the aesthetic compass of blackness is seen as undesirable. So it is within this type of atmosphere, not just in the United States, but in the Caribbean, and on the African continent itself, and in Europe, where demonstrations are taking place, that this issue um, is, that has always been here is now in the center of all things, even though there have been flare-ups along the way, all the time. So, history is very important as a, as a tool for guiding knowledge, the theory of knowledge. How do we know? What can we know? What do we teach? How can we teach? Who are, who are we, who, 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 who do we think ourselves to be? Uh, how do we identify ourselves? And how do we act in our self-interest? But what is also clear and certainly was clear to, to Rodney, but also clear to, to many black thinkers, including Gerald Horn, the American intellectual, that while the Asian Revolution opened up the way to deal with the issue of black liberation in a forceful, quite historical way and, give, and, and, and has given to the world uh, certain values of modernity, issues related to equal rights of all people, depending in, in which race would play no role in terms of how people are treated. The issue of the ending of slavery, that no one has a right to hold another's property. Ideas be that became the founding principles of the United Nations organiza organization that 
it needs a counterpart, and that counterpart is, and it has always been there. It's been there with John Brown. That is to say, white people who abhorred slavery, who abhorred colonialism, and struggle against it. People like Joe Slovo. That the more people Whatever the enlightenment, the the um the lineup of a particular period in history is that we can see playing out itself now. That freedom of people of African descent is almost impossible without a significant portion of the white population free themselves as well from white supremacy. And to a certain extent, that's what we are seeing now. But one thing is clear. It is that the philosophy of blackness articulated in the struggle against slavery and colonialism, in which we have a pantheon of thinkers like Marcus Garvey, like Blyden, like Frederick Douglass, that we should not let up in creatively teaching history and at at the university of the west in this uh, that is almost dead now in our schools similarly but if we hope to be players of our own destiny then we need to see the importance of how Walter Rodney shaped a philosophy in which history played a central role. Thank you. We have had a series of very interesting, informative, and enlightening presentations covering a range of aspects of the life and political activism of Walter Rodney, and very importantly, the intellectual life, the publications which he produced during his career. What is clear is that the example of his political activism is still very relevant. He set the example as a public intellectual. A public intellectual is one whose intellectual work, teaching, writing, and speaking takes them beyond the confines of academia and out to the general public. They feel the necessity to share that knowledge with a wider public, and they are known as public intellectuals. He was also very active in politics in Guyana, but his published work is an important legacy. His classic history on the upper Guinea coast of Africa is still required reading on courses on African history. His book, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, is still vitally important. It explains something which was not given sufficient attention in the historiography and the economic development literature, that the removal of the healthy workforce from African societies was devastating because it left behind not only disrupted economic and social systems, but the ability in those days when manpower was the key to production to have removed the healthy young part of the workforce was devastating to Africa. But he goes on to say, not only was that a major loss, but 
the exploitation which was built into colonialism, the slave trade, that surplus generated was not plowed back into African societies or into Caribbean societies, but actually went, as Eric Williams had earlier indicated, to finance the investment in the Industrial Revolution in Britain. These societies, he maintains, even in the contemporary neo-colonial period, remain in structures in a global capitalist system which essentially deprives them of much of the surplus which is generated by their activities. There is therefore the analogy which the plantation school in the Caribbean has always made that the slave plantation has had its contemporary manifestation in the multinational corporations in bauxite, sugar, and other industries. We have sought to refresh those who knew of Walter Rodney and to introduce his life and work to a wider audience because his example and his thought remain relevant to people of African descent all over the world. It only remains for me to, on your behalf, thank our presenters. I first of all want to thank the Vice Chancellor, Professor Sir Hilary Beckles, for taking time from a very busy schedule, a schedule made even more busy by the impact of COVID-19 on the education system, the Caribbean societies, and the University of the West Indies. As usual, he was enlightening, and we thank him for taking the time not only to share his thoughts, but to demonstrate the importance with which this seminar is viewed. I thank Professor Lewis, Emeritus Professor, for taking time from writing his latest book to share his thoughts with us. Very useful for us because his books are very difficult to come by these days. I hope they will soon be reprinted in a form which makes them more accessible, which reminds me I have to return his copy of his book on Walter Rodney. I thank Prime Minister Gonzales. Prime Minister Gonzales, had he not succumbed to the temptation of politics, would have certainly been a professor at some university. But he continues his intellectual life and he blends his political activism and his thought. So we're very happy to have his <clears throat> views and recollections. Professor Varine Shepherd is such an excellent communicator. It is not only good enough to have profound and important thoughts, but as important is to be able to communicate them in a form that's readily acceptable and easily understood. And this dual skill was put to good use today in her presentation. C.Y. Thomas, um, contemporary friend, colleague, fellow political activist with Walter Rodney, we appreciate his reflections because these are things that are not written down in books and journal articles and newspaper articles. So it's good to capture some of these unwritten reflections and insights and bits of history which are not often recorded in print. So we thank him for that and wish him well as he continues his activities in Guyana. Tony Bogues, although he's based in the frozen tundra of Brown University, his spirit and his mind is constantly engaged with the Caribbean. I perhaps think he benefits from some distance, which gives you a kind of reflection that you often don't get when you are in the midst of contemporary events here in the Caribbean. He's always willing to contribute and happy to have had him on the program today. <clears throat> Clinton Hutton, I'm glad we could get him away from his painting and his other activities for him to share some time with us. And I hope that 
he writes down the presentation which he made today so that it can be preserved not only in the form that we have it in now, but in a written form. David Austin again, I thank you for the impetus for this. I thank you for your contribution. We look forward to hearing more from you here in the Caribbean, although you are in Montreal, Canada. I want to remind everyone who is seeing this that it is available for posterity on uwitv.org. We have shown it today uh, on all our various popular platforms, but it is going to be available stored on our website. You can go back and enjoy it again, take notes, whatever. So I thank you for joining us. You're the reason that we do these programs and we look forward to more in the Vice Chancellor's series of forums.